Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Joy J. Moore. And I'm Christopher Fan Kaufman. And this is the podcast for February 19th, 2023, which is Transfiguration Sunday. And the text is from Matthew 16 and 17. Uh, we have on, on the, uh, the official text is 16, 24 through 17, 8. And then it says, uh, Passion Prediction Bearing the Cross Transfiguration. The actual prediction starts at 1621. So if you want to include the Passion Prediction, start at 1621. And I'd like you to do that because it sets up my uh, one of my two major talking points for today, which is the Passion Predictions are not Passion Predictions. Uh, I really ha- thought it was helpful. We've been talking about Jesus teaching. He teaches in chapters 5, 6, and 7. He teaches in 13. And um, that's really what he does when it, uh, in the other Gospels, uh, when it pulls up, uh, the, uh, when we come up to the so-called passion predictions, it actually says Jesus, usually it says Jesus began to teach them. In this case, it uh, it uses the word to show, but I think that's uh, consistent with teach. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Christopher, that Jesus is not predicting something the way that I predict, um, you know, that I might predict uh, a football game or something. I predict the the my favorite team, the Vikings, will lose because they usually do uh, in the playoffs. Well, I always do in the playoffs eventually. Um, as opposed to teach, what Jesus is doing is teaching or showing what does it mean for him to be the Christ. For him to be the Christ, it means he must suffer die, and be raised again. He's not predicting it. He's teaching what it means. Yeah. I think that's a great point, especially in Matthew, because one of the things in Matthew that we have seen and will continue to see is that Matthew is very uh, concerned to show us that this is grounded in something beyond his gospel. It's grounded in the teachings of the Hebrew scriptures. This is to fulfill the prophet saying is something well, Matthew will often remind us. And so I think this is a really good point is that Jesus is not, if we think of predicting as talking about the future, Jesus is actually showing the way in which uh, his interpretation of the scripture leads to this necessity. As do I. I really appreciate you setting that and uh, invite uh, our listeners to take the time to do the same. So that's my first uh, bit about the about this passage. Um, I don't really have anything deep to say about the second section, which is the cr- the cross and denial. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Um, there's a little bit, I think, of anachronism here in the text, uh, the the fact that Jesus has not yet died, but it's saying, take up the cross to follow him. Although, uh, Christopher, I think maybe you said to me, this was uh, a well-known saying uh, in the first century because, uh, uh, am I remembering wrong about that, Christopher? Um, I I have not heard that. I will remind our readers that it can seem because of the importance of Jesus to us, that his crucifixion is unique, but crucifixion was incredibly common in the ancient world, uh, terrifyingly so. And so I think because of that, when I say terrifyingly so, I mean thousands and thousands of people. And so it is not, it, it, it doesn't take any imagination for Jesus's hearers to understand what he means when, they, when he says, take up your cross. Uh, and so I, I, th- I would say it's probably not anachronistic in that way, in the sense that they know what he means when he tells them that this is what uh, is required of them. I, I have some comments as we move into uh, the transfiguration. Uh, so I'm just holding my comments for there. But I agree. We, we sometimes don't, um, particularly in this particular season, I think, uh, uh, for our generation, um, we we are used to living in a certain amount of comfort um, 
we uh, are, have almost been lulled into believing that Christianity is the uh, worldview of the masses. And uh, so we, we don't realize that it is as peculiar uh, and frightening to uh, the general population to claim the truths of God made known in Jesus today as it was in the first century. And if you think about the ancient prophets uh, uh, of ancient Israel, it, it was it was pretty countercultural even then. Yeah, that's helpful. That is not only is it a very dangerous thing for Jesus himself to be the Christ, he's going to be crucified, but it's a dangerous thing for many people in the world today to follow him. Not, I mean, not for not for the three of us. Uh, not only is this following Jesus uh, not put us at physical risk, it's our career. It's how we get paid and that's how we pay our bills. So it's far from terrifying. But let's remember that there are many in the world for whom simply to follow Jesus uh, is um, a life-threatening act of fidelity to God. I'll, I'll move to the transfiguration story. Um, I kind of skipped over the part where Peter gets rebuked, but I think that's important. But we can draw it in now um, because Peter first gets rebuked as Jesus teaches the meaning of, of what it is to be the Christ. And now again, we get the transfiguration story and Peter kind of likes it. You know, Lord, it's good for us to be here. So on the one hand, he doesn't want to follow Jesus or let even Jesus go to Jerusalem. It's good to be here. You get these in you get these in um, parallel, these stories. Um, I take this take, and I've said it often, people some people may have heard me say this before if they've listened to years past. Uh, my teacher, Mark Threntvite, his take on transfiguration and crucifixion was at either end of the season of Lent, because Lent starts the following Wednesday here, you have a mountain. Um, on one mountain is the Jesus we want, and on the other is the Jesus we get, right? Lit up in glory, like the Vegas Strip. Everything's great. Wow, we got we got Elijah and Moses, the two eschatological figures, come to bear witness. Isn't this great? Isn't this the Jesus we want? Maybe one who passes out uh, financial and uh, worldly rewards to those who follow him. And the other, there you get Jesus surrounded by the women who have uh, been faithful, and Peter has denied him and run away, and Judas has betrayed him, and it's dark, and there's death, and uh, the Roman Empire uh, seems to have won. And I think that's a great take for Transfiguration and Lent. And how much of the privilege we have of seeing Jesus, um, and, and I use that word to say of recognizing Jesus, that um, if we think about last week's readings um, where the judgment was beginning to happen or the, the, the caution against judgment, which is following behind, um, treat others as you would like to be treated or don't do to others what you don't want done to you. It, the trajectory of that is also a sense of we recognize who Jesus is. It's a privilege, but it's also an opportunity that has responsibility. And that responsibility, as you're pointing out, Rolf, uh, Peter wasn't sure he wanted to take that responsibility. He loved the privilege. And uh, I just want to take the rest of the story to say, Peter comes around. So we don't need to separate the wheat and the tares right now. We need to let the spirit do what the spirit does um, because Peter comes around. But are we willing to look at ourselves and say, are we having this experience of privilege or are we willing to accept the responsibility that comes because an opportunity is born because we know who Jesus is and we know that there are others who need to be introduced to the grace that he offers. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I think I really love the connection between transfiguration and Lent that you both made. And I would point out that just like Peter, we shouldn't get too dazzled by Moses and Elijah without remembering their own stories and the ways in which Moses and Elijah, just like we're going to see with Jesus, are figures who 
experience a lot of uh, <laughs> consternation at the very least in their life. Moses has to contend with Pharaoh. He has to contend with the squabbling and the complaining of the Israelites throughout his life. And at the end, he doesn't get to go into the promised land. Elijah has to deal with the prophets of Baal. He has to run away for his life from Jezebel. He also deals with so much opposition throughout his ministry. And so, and then gets taken up into heaven on that chariot of fire. And so Jesus is in this, on the transfiguration, he is dialoguing with two people who know the sufferings that he is about to undergo, who also in their service to God had to deal with opposition and angst and all of that. And so uh, it's not just a glorious scene, but it's a scene, I think, where uh, three figures who to serve God had to suffer come together before Jesus's great suffering.